man, brethren's brother Robbie. It is Monday, uh, February number one, two thousand twenty-one, and uh, had a really interesting thought. As I'm finally alone, I'm never alone on my routes or in anything I've been doing for the last while. It's hard to be alone, alone. So, anyways, when I am, I try to record if I can. But anyhow, wow, whole other world out here for me. <laughs> But I'm downtime, you know, kind of like this mode right now, thinking about some pretty powerful thoughts. Um, I was thinking about just uh, some of those moments in, in life where, where the kind of the rubber meets the road, if you will. There's a quote I remember from, uh, I can't remember who it was. I almost thought it was Ironside, but I don't think it was Ironside. It was H.I. Ironside. It was somebody else. I can't remember who it was. But he has that thing. He says, some people want to run their ministries at the sound of a chapel bell but we want to run our ministry within six feet of, of hell, you know, like right before someone dies, kind of like a deathbed ministry, like where someone's going to get it right before they die. They're going to get touched by the Lord and be right with God before they go on. Like John Wesley led that guy who was bunk, begun to be, be hung, and he started, and he met the Lord before even John Wesley knew the Lord. He led this guy to the Lord. It's a really amazing testimony. And he kept on saying, Lord, remember me, remember me, Lord. Remember me when you enter your kingdom, Lord. Remember me. And it was so powerful. He said, remember me. Be merciful to be a sinner. Powerful. And you can feel the Lord in it so powerfully. And, uh, you know, in, earlier in the nine-something years of the Westside Holiness House Church ministry, um, earlier in there, there was lots of, there was, there was people in there that had friends and family or whatever that were, that were passing on. And it was extremely different and difficult to deal with that because it was like so out of my element to be able to uh, handle people who are going through their, they're on their deathbeds, you know, and uh, I had to deal with a few of these things and it was extremely difficult, but I remembered watching like the nurses and what have you come in there and they knew how to handle the situation, even though the person's like struggling, they're acting kind of weird and they're not feeling themselves, whatever, and they know how to assert assertively kind of like say, okay, we're going to go ahead and put your seat up. We're going to give you some applesauce. Did you want some of this or do you want some oxygen, blah, blah, blah. And they just kind of certainly say what they're going to do. And they said it in a, such a productive kind of a tone that it kind of it alleviated that awkward feel sorry for them feeling. It was really nice. It doesn't solve all the problems because there's another thing we're going to get into in a second year. But I, I, I see the, I remember one guy that in particular, the, the last one that I had worked with several years back, got to look at this gentleman who, uh, big dude, really big handful. I've known him for a while and like him a lot. And, uh, he had a, a tough time speaking. He couldn't understand the way he talks because he had a speech impediment or something like that. Actually, as he got older, his, his enunciation was ex extremely difficult to understand. So he'd always be talking really loud and everything. And sometimes he'd get frustrated with that. Sometimes he'd point at his head and say like he was struggling, like, oh, something's wrong with my head. I'm struggling I can't my mind is having a hard time I'm, I'm struggling you know I'm attack under attack or something like this I don't know if it's some type of a, a curse or something I don't know what it was it was just something something was bugging him and so he's you see him in the on his deathbed uh, about you know six or seven days before he had gone on to his last breath and I got the pleasure of getting to stand with him for that moment and I, I often bring my guitar to the hospitals and whatever to uh, try to offer some type of an element of, you know, the church and ministry for the uh, for the one who's struggling, and I uh, had my guitar this time, and watching him go from kind of goofy and kind of acting strange and all this stuff, and you know, a lot of times he gets really worked up and gets really angry, and in, you know, I've seen him like that in his personal life, and I've seen him like that in the hospital, and it's really awkward because he's just a really big, huge personality, he's like a real handful, and so. I'm like, okay, you know, this is all in God's hands, you know, sometimes I'm always checking, like, to discern, is this person really right with God right now, you know, I've done that for all the people, I'm like, this is really serious, thinking, okay, are you right with God, you know, and I've seen some of the things people do before they die, and I'm like, man, <laughs> let's tune your eyes back onto track, you know, and one guy, I know that he, he got on track, and he just definitely made heaven his home, but this guy, um, I, I, he's a handful, so I'm always like, okay, okay, be discerning here and then all of a sudden I played Amazing Grace on the guitar I started to play that song and as soon as the music played his face changed from, from 
doesn't know what he was doing. I didn't have to talk assertively and bring him to a productive mode. I started to sing Amazing Grace and the music played and all of a sudden he knew where home base was. And he knew who he was. And he knew who his God was. And that's what he needed right then. It was, it was so, the look on his face as he kind of tilted his face and kind of went into the presence of God. I couldn't even look at him because I, I was trying not to cry. So I looked at the page and I was just trying to get through it and continue my job. And I didn't, I wasn't able to really enter in. I in one wondering. mile, use the right lane to exit right to exit 7677, 68th Street, M6, Lansing, Holland. I just wanted Then to, keep left. I just wanted to uh, be able to go through this mode here with him and be able to minister to him and let him receive of the Lord. And it was like, as soon as the music played, it didn't bring productive mode, it brought the presence of God and he knew who he was. And I was thinking, you know, a lot of times people aren't on their deathbed, but they feel like they are because they can't focus. They do silly things. They say stupid things. They they, they can't be motivated to do anything. They don't feel like their life made any difference. They, they feel like all that they gave was, was not enough. It was really, really a, a big challenge, honestly. I feel really bad for some of the people who, who go through these kinds of things. So... I know that there's a lot of people who've gone there, and I know what it feels like, you know, when in your life you're forced to be around people sometimes, and you're like, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I really want to serve the Lord, I, I really have every intention to, but there's mandatory things I have to do in life, like work, and be around your family, or be around community, blah, blah, blah. There's different things you have to do because of, of financial issues, family issues, health issues, whatever, and it, it, fo it focuses your your life and directs your life in different ways where you're forced to be around certain people and some of those kind of people they, they break your concentration in the things that you're trying to do you have all these great intentions and sometimes just natural things in life little things can, can make it so difficult for you to really flow through with all the things you really wanted to go through in, in order to, to be all you can be for God some people can have their their sleep broken very easily they need to have things just a certain way they want a fan on or they want a noise white noise or they want no noise. They want it all, all dark or just one little light. Or the window open or the window shut. And it has to be just like this and then I can sleep. And then you can break my sleep. Or you can don't talk around me because it'll break my concentration when I'm studying. Or don't break, don't do these kinds of things in your life because it'll break my concentration overall with my focus and my heart yielding to the, to the face of God. And sometimes we're like that. We feel like we're, our, we're living our, life, our whole life on a deathbed. Our whole life feels like a deathbed. Like we're not getting anything done. We don't feel like we are what we know we're supposed to be doing. And it's, it's very discouraging sometimes. So having given that, all of a sudden the music plays and you know who you are. You know your home base. You remember all of a sudden there's nothing that's changed. My life is exactly as it was. But all of a sudden presence of God comes and gives me a right view on where I'm at right now. Everything is not looking that great, but it all feels more than great because he gave me peace in the battle. He gave me peace in the midst of this grave I'm standing in. I'm not even there yet. I'm living on a deathbed. My life is a deathbed right now, but I feel like but yet the presence of God comes. The music begins to play and I know who my God is again. And I know where my real rock is again. And I know he's building his people. I know he's He's holding his people. He's, he's continued to, to build up his people. And whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? That's what I've seen a lot of these people do. They, they, they don't have anybody to help, help them get their mind on track. It doesn't mean that they're not on track. It just means that their mind for the moment isn't on track. They're staring at things that they shouldn't be staring at. Talking silly, acting silly. You know, if you don't be assertive with that, they start acting like they're feeling sorry for themselves and acting like they're delirious or acting crazy or whatever. And that's just how people are when they're on their in their life. They feel like they're on their deathbed. They act delirious. They act crazy. They talk crazy. They don't feel like they're supposed to. But when the music plays, that familiar song to your heart where you know you met the Lord and all of a sudden you remember who you are in God. You remember your position in Christ. You remember your validity, your validity in Christ. You remember your... your you are part of his possession. You are part of his inheritance. And you have what you need to have in the things of God. Confusion will 
will happen all the time because there's a lot of mandatory things we got to get around and it breaks our concentration on the things we wanted. But God's blessing is there nonetheless. God's pr presence is there nonetheless. And the music plays and we all know exactly who we are in Christ. Amen.